Thank you. I appreciate that. If you have a Bible, I ask you to turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm going to go ahead and admit that I'm really nervous. You guys make me nervous. I uh, did not go to Anderson University. I went to another Christian school. Um, really, it's been almost, it's been like spanning four decades ago now, because it's the 90s when I graduated. That means that was a different, four decades ago, a different century and a different millennium. So I went to college a long time ago, and in going there, I also had to attend chapel. And having to attend chapel, we had to sit alphabetically. Do y'all have to sit alphabetically? Okay, that's, I had to sit alphabetically, so don't tell me how hard you have it. That meant you didn't know the people beside you, and you, just, you only hoped they were cool. You know what I'm saying? This was just, you were hoping, because you were there, and we had to go to chapel every week, twice a week, and could not miss and it was a grade, by the way. You had to get an A in the class chapel just by attending. So I'm just telling you how hard I had it. That, can, that way you can relate to me and feel sorry for me off the bat. Also, this past week, I turned 45. So I know you're looking like, man, 45 is old. But you look at me and you're like, man, this guy looks really young. It's just hard work to do that. Uh, but I turned 45 this past week. So as I was preparing, I wanted to come this morning and to bring some advice from a grandfatherly figure for you guys bring some advice that may help you from God's word as you consider your own life here in college first advice when I was in chapel I made a living making fun of chapel speakers I joked on them all the time I picked on what they said I talked about how bad they were and critiqued them it worked really good the people next to me who were strangers when the semester started we bonded over making fun of whoever's speaking in chapel so today that is coming back to haunt me right here I am sure first advice don't do that you may be speaking up here one day okay you may be in my shoes so that's my first advice after that I just want to look to God's word though and give you some advice from God's word on structuring our lives according to his word and what you can be doing even now where you are in college and what I wish I would have done maybe in college a little more using my own testimony. I thank Dr. Whitaker for allowing me the privilege to come and speak. Dr. Didway, a good friend. What a great place uh, to be at Anderson University. And so as we look to God's word and look together this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us and your kindness to us. And today, the fact that we are here is a testimony of your kindness. Father, thank you so much for the truth that you've given us to live by in your word. And now we ask, Father, just as we sang, that we will praise your name. Help us to praise your name, not just in this room, but everywhere on this campus and everywhere we go in this world. Help us to live for your glory and live for your name and consider what it means to be a true, faithful follower of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Before we look to this passage, I want us to consider what time we are in. We are in January of 2020. January of 2020. That means uh, this is a new year. And every time you have a new year, you kind of think through and uh, think through what you want to do different from the year before, especially if you came off a bad fall semester and now you're entering into a new spring semester and you're, you're kind of thinking through what you want to do different, kind of recalibrate the semester just beginning, recalibrate even now to think, how am I going to do this different? But, but let me even add to the intensity of that. Not only that, this is the beginning of a new decade. And as we look back in history, we kind of categorize things in decades, you know. We, we talk about the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the greatest decade of all time, the 90s. We talk about the 2000s and the 2010s, and we speak of those decades in their hairstyles, their clothes styles, the music we were listening to. All of those trends we kind of put together in a decade. And so as we begin this decade, and as some of y'all, most of y'all I'm assuming are here in college, in the next 10 years, you'll be out of college. By God's grace, you'll be in your career. By God's grace, you'll have a family. By God's grace, you'll be... Do 10 years from now, it's going to be a big change for you guys. And so where do you want to be and how do you want to be living and what do you want to be known for? That's the determination you need to be making even today. 
setting yourself up for this next decade, thinking through what it is that, that I want to be, who do I, what kind of person do I want to be, what do I want to be following, what do I want to be doing? As we look to God's Word, we're going to look to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And again, I think God's Word gives us some good advice, some advice I wish I would have had in college, some things I wish I would have known that Paul tells to Timothy. Paul's writing this letter to Timothy at, at the end of his life. So he's, he's at the end of his career, and Timothy's a young, a young minister in training, if you will. So Paul is explaining to him what it means to be a faithful leader, a faithful follower, one who will serve well. And in writing this, he tells him what, what a good leader looks like, like in chapter 3 when he talks about the qualifications for overseers and deacons, what a good leader looks like and what are those qualities. And then in chapter 4, he begins by talking about what a bad leader looks like and what one who will seek to lead you astray will do. So he comes down to verse 6 in chapter 4, and that's where I want to pick up. After he's discussed what a good leader looks like, what a bad leader looks like, and now he's telling Timothy, here's what I want you to do. He says to Timothy in verse 6, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Here, the Apostle Paul, I think, is going to give us three important pieces of advice that I think will help you as college students, as you seek to live your life over those next 10 years or the next lifetime, as you prepare yourself on what you should be about and what you should be pursuing. Again, advice that I wish I had listened to carefully when I was your age. The first is this. The first piece of advice I want to offer is this from God's Word. You must identify yourself. You must identify yourself. And what I mean by that and what I'm hoping by that is identify yourself as belonging to Jesus. Each one of us must determine who it is we are living for. And that happens even now on this campus. What, is you, what, what gives you your, your motivation? Who is it that gives you your purpose? Who is it that you are living for? Paul says to Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Paul says, Timothy, if you will lead well, if you will trust in the Lord, you will be a good servant of Christ. He identifies Timothy as a servant of Christ. Now, when we look through scriptures, we see other things. We see a, a soldier or one who, uh, a warrior for, for Christ, one who completes the good warfare, Paul says, or, or we see an ambassador for Christ, or we see a child of the King of Christ, of, of, of the Lord. So we see these different identity markers, but what, what's happening here is Paul is saying what's most important for you is that you would identify yourself as belonging to Jesus, a servant of Christ. Paul is saying that when we identify with Christ, now we have our priorities set. And what I want to make the claim to you or give the advice to give to you is that this becomes most important. There are many years of your life you can waste spinning your wheels trying to pursue stuff that doesn't ultimately matter. There's many times in your life you can waste just doing things and going after things that cannot eternally be significant to you. And you look back and what do you have but nothing but grains of sand that have fallen through your hands and you don't know where it's at. What happens for me when I look back, and even as I counsel people in my own church and talk to them, this is one of the great issues they've had, is for years, their identity has not been found in Christ. And when their identity is not found in Christ, their priorities are not right. And when their priorities are not right, they seem to waste their life away. Ultimately, Paul is saying this is the most important thing. You must identify yourself. I know today many of you struggle maybe with the issue of identity some find it in their family some find it in their ability some find it in their talents some don't find it in any of those things and struggle some find it in sexuality some find it in friendships some find it even in schoolwork and as you get older the problem of searching for your identity doesn't really stop 
You find it in your wife or your husband. You find your identity in your children. You find it in your career. That problem what will not stop. It does not go away. But today, there is one thing that we can say, one thing that can determine your identity more than anything else, more important than all of those factors, and more important than all those things that we concern ourselves about, and that is whether or not you are in Christ. The prevailing way that Scripture speaks of the Christian is one of identity. Over 75 times in the New Testament, the Christian is said to be in Christ. It is the most popular way that the New Testament describes us. We often talk about inviting Jesus into our hearts, Jesus into us, but the Scripture rarely speaks that way. The Scripture more explicitly says we are in Christ. Our identity is found there. In fact, There are only two types of people in this room right now. Ultimately and finally, there are only two types of people here. There are only those who are in Christ and then there are those who are not. Really, the scripture uses the law of the excluded middle over and over again. There's no middle ground. Either you're on the narrow path or you're on the wide. Either you're a sheep and you're on the right side or you're a goat and you're on the left. Either you are entering into the kingdom, a child of, the God, of God, or you are not. Either you are one who has bowed your knee and praised the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, or you have not. You still have not been submissive. Either or you've been born again or you are still dead in your trespasses and sins. There's only two types of people here. Ultimately, this is the identity that only really matters. The world is going to try to tell you that your identity is found in so many different intersections of so many different things in so many different places. But what I'm telling you is this. The day you stand before your maker in heaven, the only question that's going to be asked of you is whether or not you are in Christ. And ultimately, ultimately, you're not going to have the guts to speak up. Ultimately, you're not going to have the, the, the audacity as the Lord God Almighty, creator of the heavens and earth, ask you, why should I let you into my kingdom? You're not going to have the audacity to speak. You may have your plan. Let me go ahead and, and set you straight on this. You may have your plan of what you might want to say. You may have your argument of all of your accomplishments. You may have your resume finished and completed. You may have your degrees hanging on the wall. You may have all of that. Your argument is fit and ready for why the Lord God is going to let you into his kingdom. You may have all of that prepared. And when he asks you, I can go ahead and tell you, you're not going to have the audacity to speak. You're going to know your place is not to speak up now. Your only hope at that moment, your only hope at that moment is that somebody speaks up for you. Your only hope at that moment is that you hear the very Savior himself, Jesus Christ the Lord, say, Father, this one is mine. So in this essence, the Lord says, if you're ashamed of me before men, I'm going to be ashamed of you before the Father. And he's not talking about the one time you came down front and took a hand of a pastor. He's talking about how you live your life every single day before others. Your only hope is that that one speaks up for you, Jesus Christ himself. And he says, if you're ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father. So you must identify yourself today. You must determine that it's not I or me, Josh, that I am living for. It is my Savior, my King, my Lord, Jesus Christ himself. You must make your identity in Christ. You must repent and believe and trust in him. You must follow after him and say, he is my priority and there is no other. And I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure what anybody else thinks about it. And I don't really matter to me because what's most important to me is that on the day that he calls me home, he says, this one is mine. That's the decision you have now. And there's really no other decision that matters more. How you live and how you identify yourself, whether or not it is in Christ or not, is the ultimate of decisions. Now, I uh, had this same experience. All I ever wanted to do growing up was play basketball. That's all I like to do. I did it every day. 
All I ever wanted was a basketball scholarship. So I graduated from Lexington High School and, and, and got a little basketball scholarship to a school in Georgia. I thought I had made it. This was it. I'm going. I'm a preacher's kid. So I grew up in the church. I never really rebelled. I was always a good kid. I trusted the Lord early. I followed after him. Tried to. Went to youth group. Went to camp. Went to everything. I did it all. Loved the Lord. Truly believed it. But when I got to college... I got there early as basketball players did. We were getting there, getting, go ahead and starting conditioning, doing some other things, getting to know each other. I got to college, I was unpacking my stuff. And I started thinking about this. My whole life I've kind of been identified as the preacher's kid. I, I belonged in that little circle. Everybody in my hometown knew me that way. But not here. I'm in Georgia somewhere. These people don't know me real well. And I can remember explicitly. I can remember explicitly making a decision when I was packing my stuff in my dorm and setting it all up. I can explicitly remember taking my Bible and putting it in the drawer. Let me see if I can do this a little different, I was thinking. Yeah, I was a believer. Yeah, I truly believe I was in Christ. But I made a decision at that moment that I wasn't going to identify with him right away. Let's see how this goes for me. About four months later, I, in the middle of a game halftime walking out I was a bitter and angry kid I was in a tournament in Florida so I was a long way from home bitter and angry walking out the coach says something smart aleck to me I mean it was smart aleck I'm not gonna get him off the hook and I lashed out for four months I tried to be living as somebody I was not I tried to identify myself with one that was in opposition to the very one I loved and saved me. And I lashed out. I quit at halftime. Called my dad. Back then we had to call collect. There's a little phone that did this. And you spun. Never mind. Hard to explain. Called my dad and said, can you come get me in Florida? I just quit. Ultimately, I made a decision as I went to college that I was going to try to find my own identity I wish somebody would have told me then how foolish that was because when we pursue our, our identity in anything or anybody other than Christ it only leads to that kind of brokenness and bitterness second the second piece of advice I want to give to you in God's word is you must train yourself for godliness I'm going to work under the assumption now and, and it's okay to do this. I'm going to work under the assumption that all of you are in Christ. If you are not in Christ, then this is where the, the, the sermon ends for you, if you will. Repent and believe and trust in him. Find your identity in the only one that can satisfy you. But so if you are, now what's next for us? We must train ourselves up in godliness. Paul says this, you're a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Train yourself for godliness. Like a good servant should, you must train yourself to be the one who will serve your king, the one who will serve the one who, who leads you. So, so you train yourself on what, what that looks like. The scripture says this is pursuing after godliness. By the way, Hebrews tells us that without holiness, holiness and godliness go together. Without holiness, no one sees the Lord. And so if you want to follow after the Lord and you have made Christ your top priority, now you must train yourself up in godliness. You must train yourself up to pursue after holiness. Now, how do we do this? Here it says that we do this with words of uh, faith and of good doctrine. There are three main ways, I believe, and I'm just going to lay out there to you so that way you can hold on to this. Three main ways that you must be regularly training yourself up in godliness. Three main ways. First, you must be reading your Bible. Bible intake. You must be looking to God's Word. How else are you going to know the words of faith? How else are you going to know what good doctrine is? How else are you going to know these things unless you are looking and reading and taking in God's Word? This is like food for the believer, right? This is like good bread and wine. This is like good drink. This is solid for us. And so whenever we are looking to how to sustain ourselves daily, then we eat. We've got to break up out of here and go and eat. Why? Because we need sustenance, right? 
So it is for the believer, we need to eat. We need to eat this good, faithful meat that the Lord has provided for us so that we can be sustained. So that we can be sustained. You cannot go after a life that is identifying with Christ without feeding upon the meal that Christ has provided for you. You cannot pursue after a life identifying with Jesus without taking in what he is giving you. Now, I don't have time to explain to you what the word is. You've got good, faithful Bible teachers here that can tell you exactly what the scripture is, can tell you how the scripture is a treasure in our hands, how no way on this earth would we ever know about God. Not only will we never ever know about God, we will never really know about his salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, unless he has revealed himself. He was kind in revealing himself in the beauty of creation and seeing the majesty and glory and all of that. But even when we see a beautiful sunset, it never tells us, oh man, I need Jesus. We needed something extra for that, right? And so he has freely given us his word to say, here he is. This is the one you have been longing for and looking for, and you didn't even know it. You see, the scriptures are all about how God has come to us and saved us. And so this precious gift to us should be one that we not only carry in our hands, but we take into our hearts, hide in our hearts, right? It should be the one that we hold fast to and never take for granted that we've got the revelation of God at the palm of, in the palm of our hands. It's foolishness for us to think that we can know God without his word, for that's how he's taught us. And so it's foolishness for us to think we can live a Christian life without his word. Second, we must pray. If the word of God is meat and drink for us that sustains us, Prayer is our very breath. You see, in prayer, we are admitting every single time that we are utterly and completely dependent upon him. And I don't know if y'all know this, but you cannot cause your lungs to fill up with, with carbon dioxide or oxygen or whatever we, whatever we have. You can ask biology class, ask the professors. You cannot cause your lungs to even fill up and give you strength. How many times y'all made yourself breathe? That's a gift from God every single time. How many times have you caused your heart to beat? You can't do that. That is God's gift to you. And so every single day we are reminded with the breath we breathe and every time our heart beats and the blood pumps through our veins that God has given us another moment. And that breath he gives us, never should we take that and curse him with it. But we pray. And we give it back to him. And we get to know him. And what I need you to know today is God is not one that we simply experience. God is one that we get to know. Because he's a person. Oftentimes we see it as just an experience. So you come in here, you feel good. That song made me feel right. I got to know a little bit. I experienced God today. But that would be weird if I said that about Dr. Didway, right? Hey, I came, I hung out with Dr. Didway, and I experienced him. That would be strange. No, I got to know him. The Lord is one we seek to know. And we pray. Just like we speak to our friends. Just like we speak to our loved ones. Just like we call our mama at home and our father. Just like we let them know we're okay. Just like we ask them of money and other things we need. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Just like we do all of that. The Lord says, come to me. And here's what you need to know. The God of the universe... The maker of heaven and earth, he spoke. It wasn't, he spoke and it is. The God of the universe has obligated himself to you. Now that should blow our minds. Maybe you wasn't listening, maybe you're talking to the friend making fun of me, but that's cool. I did the same thing. The God of the universe has obligated himself to us when we come in the name of Christ. What do I mean by that? He says, if you ask, I'll answer. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, it will be open. In other words, all you got to do is come to me and I am listening. I have bent my ear toward you, as Psalm 116 says. I hear your cries and I hear your prayers. I hear you. The Lord God of the universe has leaned his ear in towards you when you come to him in Christ. Jesus has modeled prayer for us he has secured prayer for us and god is good that he has heard our prayers 
So why would we waste that? Third, if we're going to train ourselves up, not only must we take in God's word, we must pray, we also must worship. We are not meant to go at this thing alone. But we have been given each other as believers together to walk together. We've been given each other so that when we come together collectively, what's the thing Christians should do? When Christians gather together in a place and we set a time like 10, 10, and we gather together in a place, what is it appropriate for the believer to do? Worship. But not only when we gather together corporately, when we're privately, we walk in, what is it appropriate for us to do? Worship. It is appropriate for us to understand that the scriptures teach everything in our life, everything in our life should be done to the glory of God with thanksgiving in our heart for what he has given us. And therefore, everything is an act of worship. Worship is a testimony to how much God is worth. And if you have a scale here, right? And you have God on one side and you have all else that we can offer on this side. You see what I'm saying? God is going to outweigh all of this. So what do we do? We spend our life heaping our worship on this other side so that God gets the glory that he deserves. So everything we do in our life and everything we put our hand to, whatever career it may be, whatever option it may be, we throw it on this side knowing that God is worthy of it. And we want to give him the worth that he deserves you see God has made a promise to us he's made a promise that if we seek him we'll find him he's made a promise that he'll take our tired worn out hearts and he'll make them new he'll give us rest too often times we look to train ourselves up or to grow in other places we're over here thinking this might help us we're over here doing this we're over here doing that right but God has said this is where I bless my people. In my word, in prayer, in worship, here it is. David Mathis in his book, Habits of Grace, puts it this way. These are the train tracks by which the train is running. If you're going to catch the train, if you're going to be, be uh, uh, on board this train, if you're going to find this train, you simply need to go to the tracks and it's coming by. So it is with Bible intake with scripture, with prayer and worship. These are the things God has said he would bless. And so see, we simply get in the way of his blessing. My experience in the same way comes to this passage. He says, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. Again, I told you, I, basketball in college, I transferred. I went to a different school when the Lord called me into the ministry, brought me, broke me down, showed me my need for him, called me and said, I'm going I'm to use you, Josh. Took me to a different school when I went and played basketball there. Not my plan, his plan. And it was six, seven hours a day, trained up. I spent a majority of my college career in the gym or in the training room. I spent a majority of my time there. I studied, I learned, did the best I could, but I spent a majority of time in the gym and training. I'm always, I was always trying to make my body better. If I play basketball today, I told you I was 45. If I play basketball today, don't get me wrong, I still take anybody in here, but if I play basketball today, it will take me four days to recover. And that's on a good day. That's if nothing pops, breaks, or snaps. In other words, I spent my, half my life, 22 years really, spent half my life training my body up to do something. And today, I'm my son's eighth grade coach. I'm just trying not to get technicals. That's all I got. I spent a majority of my time to play something that I can't hardly play anymore. That's what Paul is saying. Training up your bodies is good for some things. It's got some value in it. But let's talk about your spiritual life. You see, you can train up your body and you can do that, and that is good. But it is far more important. It is far more important for you to train after godliness. For godliness lasts forever. Basketball is done about 24, 25. I hit my peak lasted three months third and finally 
you must prepare yourself. As you come to college, that's what you do. You are getting ready for something, right? You're preparing yourself for your career. You're preparing yourself to be a good father, a good mother, a good worker with your gifts and your talents. You're honing in the things you love and, and what God's called you to. You're honing those things in so you can go and make a life for yourself and you can advance. Even, even in your identities in Christ, you can advance and you're preparing yourself, right? Here Paul says that when we train up ourselves in godliness, it prepares us for the present. That is good. It makes us better people, better faithful followers of Jesus, better believers. Better believers. I love the fact Charles Spurgeon in the front of his Bible just simply had, Lord, make me a better believer. That was it. That's my prayer every day. Lord, just make me a better believer. And that's what it does. It makes us better believers. At the same time, at the same time, training up ourselves for godliness training up ourselves for godliness doesn't just have some benefit in the present paul says but it has eternal benefit because we are not just getting ourselves ready to work at the factory or to do the job at the church or to do this or to do that we're getting ourselves ready to spend eternity in heaven under the employ of our savior paul says this it holds for promise for the present life and also for the life to come. You must recognize, as you identify yourself in Christ, as you train up yourselves in godliness, you must recognize that in this world, we're just strangers and pilgrims. We're just passing through. That we'll seek to do all that God has called us to do here, but ultimately, we were made for the life that is to come. We were made for what is coming for us. We were made for eternity. We were made for spending time there. I had somebody ask me, they were reading, we were reading in Isaiah 6, and it's, you know, constantly the angels are singing, holy, 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 you know. So I, I tell my men in my church that don't like to sing, you know, you know how men are, they act like they're all cool to sing. I tell my men in the church that don't like to sing, I said, well, hey, man, you might not like heaven too much because as far as I can read it, that's what we're going to be doing. And so ultimately, we get there and, and, and you see People always ask, man, what are we going to do? You got the amazing grace. We've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, right? What are we going to be doing for 10,000 years? And I just simply answer, we are going to be worshiping. Well, I can't sing that long, man. Two verses kills me on the side. When you realize ultimately and forever your satisfaction is found in Christ, when you realize he's most precious and everything else just fades away. When you get to that moment, when you get to that moment that you understand, that you understand that only in Christ do you have eternity and only in Christ do you have what you have and it's only because of him that you are even alive here in his presence. You were dead in your trespasses and sins but he made you alive. It's only Christ that has given you these things. Then your thanksgiving, your joy wells up to where all you want to do is praise him. I find it fascinating. In Revelation, you see Jesus mentioned different ways. He's the lion, you know what I'm saying? John's over here weeping because nobody opened up the scrolls. He taps on his shoulder. Hey, man, that lion of Judah has conquered. Weep no more. And, and, and John goes, as, as the angel tells him that the lion of Judah has conquered, weep no more. And John looks to see the lion. And what does he see? He sees a lamb standing there as one slain. But that's not the only time. Any other time you see the people singing in Revelation before Jesus as he's on his throne, what do they see? The lamb, Revelation 7. Salvation belongs to our God and to the lamb. In Revelation 22, there he is, the lamb slain for us. Over and over again, when they look up, they see him as a lamb. And why is that? That's because of this. Those who are in heaven, and one day I hope to be, those who are in heaven will always look to Christ and they will be reminded every single time that they are only there because of what he did on the cross for their sins. The only reason they are in his presence, the only reason they have eternity, the only reason they know what complete and utter satisfaction is, is because of what Jesus did for them as the lamb slain. You will never forget it. And you will never want to. And you will never stop singing his praises. So train yourself up with your body. Prepare yourself up for a career, for a job, for a life that glorifies God. But get your hearts ready. 
for eternity. Pursue after godliness. I had a, a girl sitting beside me on chapel. I told y'all I had to sit alphabetically. A girl sat on my right side. A guy sat on my left. I was in the middle of the road, which is awful. Didn't know him when the semester started. I told you that. We bonded over making fun of chapel speakers. We became friends. You know, college happens, you leave, you lose touch. What I find fascinating, and I tell you this today, what I find fascinating is both of those individuals are no longer with us. Both of them have died and gone on to be with the Lord. I'm only 45. I know y'all think that's old, but man, 20 years? What I'm telling you is this. We can make all the plans. We can have all the desires. We can set all our goals and aspirations. But ultimately and finally, it is the Lord who holds it in his hand. So identify yourself with him. Train yourself up as his follower. And prepare yourself to be with him forever. For you do not know when that is coming. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day, this opportunity, this gift of your word. God, you were kind to us. And allow us the privilege of being here in this place, proclaiming your name. Father, as we close out, I pray for all of those that are in this room today, that are hearing in other places on campus. I pray, Father, that their desire would be to identify with you, that they would not be ashamed of that and you would not be ashamed of them, that they would pursue after godliness, Father, by training themselves up with good doctrine and faith through the Bible, through prayer, through worship, and that they would prepare themselves to meet you face to face one day for the glory of your name. We pray all this in Jesus. Amen.